Well, students, welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Dr. Krishnan Dure, teaching in the Department of Ancient Indian History and Culture, University of Calcutta. Today, we have assembled here to learn how economy or economic sector was totally controlled by the state. It's an unprecedented event in early Indian history when we see that entire all the economic activities of the people were totally controlled by the state authorities. Now how this was possible let us see through our sources. First of all 600 BC to 325 BCE this period is very very important in almost every respect economic economically particularly agricultural production due to natural rainfall and river waters land was very very fertile and all these factors facilitated the task of production particularly agricultural production first of all this agricultural production or goods were used by the people first of all how we come to know about all these things we have both archaeological as well as literary sources first of all archaeological sources or excavations reports tell us that there was agricultural activity and in that connection agricultural implements like iron hoe iron plow spade etc etc all these things were used because we have all these things from the earth from under the earth so we have concluded that these tools might have been used by the people in connection with their agricultural production after that we have later Vedic sources particularly textual sources from where we have some important information relating to the production of agriculture so these two types of sources information if we put together then we have very good impression about how people had developed their agricultural activities particularly rice etc etc besides these we have another category of people who produced various types of materials which people had used in their daily lives first of all the in this connection also we have very good sources binoy putako mudji monika these are pali sources and also uh, sanskrit sources we have so in this connection these sources tell us many things about the production of artisanal artisanal productions particularly dantokaro that is uh, ivory worker and <coughs> there the, the, these these uh, artisans also organized themselves in order to defend their professional activities and in that connection we have references to pugo shongo seni gono etc etc and another sort of another sort of uh, evidence we have that is northern black polished ware this is this is very very important ware because these wares were produced by a group of people and used also by common people because even today also you see that there are many things which the common people use not all the people because common people are many and for them they produced all these things these were materially produced by the artisanals so these things with these things people developed their working relations we have agricultural and artisanal developments we have seen 
in this connection we have seen another major development that is trade and commerce under the supervision or rather under the uh, with the help of the setthi or sarthabaho that is uh, businessmen traders they might have carried on maritime trade also because we have two references samudra vanijya and samudri kayo these references we have but on the basis of these references we cannot claim that they certainly carried on maritime trade might have but still they carried on overland trade and trading activities were carried on in connection with the common people in association with the common people because people also needed many things and those things could be reached them through the channels of trade and commerce all these economic activities agrarian and non agrarian together produced a scenario that is how people had developed particular space geographical space or transformed a particular geographical space into a urban space urban place urban area because urban area or urban center or urban space whatever you call is lived by a certain particular group of people for example rich people rulers and the ruled and particularly those people who provide their residences at that place so highly specialized groups of people a particular groups of people live there in order to fulfill their purposes social economic and other purposes so this is how they produced urban centers and in this connection we also find another thing that is mahajanapada mahajanapadas is very very important development in this period that is 600 to 325 bce mahajanapada is a development of a janapada when it conquered another janapada resulted into the creation of a mahajanapada larger janapada it means one janapada was conquering or janapada ruler was conquering another janapada and this is how mahajanapada was created it means there were activities towards conquest of land and this conquest was carried on by the king who created mahajanapadas and in this connection we have well known mahajanapada that is magadha which emerged as an empire ultimately so this is how the development went on social economic all these factors together paved the way to the rise of the empire that is the mauryan empire and in that connection mauryan empire we have already seen that there were too much resources and there were people who produced many things many different kinds of things all these resources could be tapped and in that connection they that is the ruler that is mauryan ruler necessitated next slide mauryan ruler necessitated the procurement of all these sources in order to stabilize their royal control so in that connection they felt the necessity of having one full treasury and and full full length army all these things necessitated in turn resources so only from the people 
cess collection was not sufficient enough for the completion or the fulfillment of the treasury or maintenance of the army. So, there were necessities of collecting more resources and that is why we find the state control over the economic activities of the people. So, this is how we come to the main area of our discussion this is the state controlled economy. Now, next first of all as we have seen that people have already first of all produced agricultural goods. So, let us see what is the scenario in agriculture. First control of the state was maintained by taking agricultural production under their royal control. As you have already heard it, agriculture was placed under the supervision and control of the high ranking official agronomoi or that is uh, Shitad, that is uh, according to Megasthenish. Now, Shitad Dhaksha in the Orthoshastra is mentioned as the supervisor of agricultural activities. He was high ranking official. The officer had to be well versed in agriculture, Brikshayur Veda. He had also to collect the seeds of all fruits, flowers, grains, vegetables. Remember, all these things were produced. And in that connection, agricultural officer that is Srita Dhaksho was to collect all these things for the production of these things. And in that connection, for the health of the trees, of the plants, he was to be aware of the Briksha Vedu. So, he had also to collect the land for the production of agrarian goods was to be ploughed up well. Shita Dhaksho was to appoint agricultural laborers. In this connection, we find three categories of people. First of all, laborers, simple laborers. They paid only laborers and in lieu of that paying labor to the land, they received certain amount of produce from the land. And there were some other people who provided the plow and in that connection for, in, for the production work and in lieu of that they received certain amount of produce one fourth or one fifth of the crops from the land. So, what we were talking about? We were talking about the laborers who paid their labor in connection with the production of agriculture and in that connection supervisor the supervisor Shita Dhaksho was to appoint these people for the purpose of production in the land. So, we find in this connection three categories of people. First of all, we find the laborers who paid only their labor for the production. In lieu of that, they received certain amount of production from the state. There were another category of people who paid who, who provided their plough for the purpose of production and in lieu of that they were given some amount of produce. And there were there was another group of people who paid who was who, who were provided entire help from the state and in lieu of that they paid only labor. In lieu of that they get go, got on one fourth or one fifth part of the produce. Next we see Mauryan state is known to have established control over agriculture and in that connection we find another land settlement prob, uh, program on behalf of the state. And in this connection, we find what it is. This is Janapadanivesha. It is very interesting and very important part of economic activities under the Mauryan state. In this section, what we get? We get Mauryan state formed its control over the agricultural production by adopting the policy of land settlement. Janapada is one of the elements, seven elements of the state. 
Sami, Amatta, Janapada, Durga, Kosha, Bolo, and Mitra. And Janapada is a wealth. It was important for the king to settle land for the kingdom. The Janapada was considered as a wealth for the state when, as you already know, when a new Janapada was settled, the available land there was divided into two categories such as taxable and tax-free. The taxable land was reserved for the priest and the royal officer. The taxable lands were divided into two types. First type of land prepared by the measures on behalf of the king, it was given to those who paid taxes for one generation. They were considered as the tenants of the king. The other type of land was given to him who could develop the land without taking assistance from the king. The royal authority was keen on utilizing the agrarian properties of a land. If anyone was found to have neglected the agrarian works, the land was taken from him and given to someone else for further production. Remember, production work could not be suppressed, could not be disturbed by any means or at any cost. In the beginning of the land settlement, the king usually supplied cash and cattle seeds for the development of agriculture. The king was also to take care of the fact that the land would not be settled without the entertainer. With the entertainer, that is, they included the dancer, singer, entertaining place like a garden. These elements would cause hindrance to the work of the development of the land under settlement. Remember one thing, the, these people cannot produce things in the land, so they should be kept away from the production land, so that the work of production is not disturbed. Very scientific. The development of agricultural production of the land would strengthen the pace of the state. The king was enjoined to maintain the old Janapadas also. He was also to settle new Janapadas for the kingdom. Very simple. Why new Janapadas? Because we have to produce more and more resources for the interest of the kingdom. That's why new Janapadas. That's why new more and more production, more and more resources. In this connection, agricultural production is also facilitated by irrigation. So therefore, we may come to irrigation. What we get? The development of agriculture depends on irrigation. Agronomy supervises the work of irrigation. Regular distribution of water for irrigation according to the Greek ambassador Megasthenes. The royal control of the work of irrigation is evidenced by the Junagar Prasasti of the Khatrapa king Rudradamun I. The large irrigation project Sudarshan Lake at Junagar in Gujarat was completed under supervision of Pushyagupta, provincial governor of Chandragupta Maurya. And this shows the control of the king over the irrigation works. Royal control over irrigation continued. A few outlets were added to the water reservoir that is uh, Sudarshan Lake for irrigation project during the period of the Mauryan king Ashoka. It is also proved by the connection of the state of the water cess called Udakobhago from the cultivator. In this connection, another point is also to be taken care of. The debated question of the ownership of land. Who was the owner of the land? All ownership vested with the king. Is it so? There was private ownership also. Shita land, that is crown land, was definitely under the state control. But there were other types of lands who, which were controlled by the private individuals. So, we have two types of lands, private ownership and royal ownership. And royal ownership included not only Shita land, but also other categories of land. That is, uh, Mauryan state control over the uh, land was in practice. Therefore, it became necessary to frame rules to settle the disputes related. That is, if Private ownership existed. In that connection, disputes might arise. So, state was aware of the fact. And in that connection, he, it also framed rules. We have many rules in the Orthoshastra relating to the settlement of the land disputes. 
So Mauryan state control over the economy, agrarian economy became possible due to the fact that the state owned a huge amount of landed wealth. Apart from the Shita land, the king also enjoyed the right over seven other types of land. These were fallow land, forested land, newly settled Janapada, mines, mining wealth, irrigation projects, pasture lands, etc. etc. Besides economic agricultural activities, we also find non-agricultural activities which are also controlled by the state. And in this regard, let us first start with artisanal activities because people also need artisanal activities, utensils, etc., etc., many other things for the sake of living. So what those are? There were many artisans in the society according to the Greek accounts. The shipbuilding, weapon making industries were under the control of the state. There was private ownership in other industries also as even today also we have private ownership in industrial activities we see. But that too was under the monitoring of the state. Megasthenes mentions a group of royal officers who supervise the works of industrial production, the artisanal activities were necessarily to be controlled by the state because it was the responsibility of the state to save the people from the fraudulent activities of the artisans. Even today we find artisans to have frauded the people by selling undesirable goods. What we get next? The influence of the artisanal guild, as we have already talked about, that artisans, in order to defend their professional activities, they also produced, they also organized, they had also professional organizations in continuation. We, during this phase also, that is during the rule of the Mauryas, we find guild, which possibly came to be less during the Mauryan period than what it was during the pre-Mauryan period because of the fact it was completely angle or vision of the state authority that traders were kontoko, they were detrimental, they should be refined, that is shodhana. This is how we find kontoko shodhana in the Arthashastra. They should be under control of the Shodhana means they should be under control of the state. They should be under the check, checks of the authority so that they could not deceive the people. They could not cheat the people. That is how they were controlled by the state authority. What we get next? The mines and mining industries are also to be under the state control. The matter was supervised by the Akaradhaksha. You may in this connection compare this under the Ministry of Industry as we find in India today, which control ministry, mining and etc. etc. industrial activities. So in this case, in, during the rule of the Mauryas, we find the Akarodhaksha who controlled only mining operations. He was to be well versed in the affairs of mining and metallurgy. Remember how educated that individual was, desirable qualifications was. According to Kautilya, the mines constitute the basis of the properties of Kosho, Dando and or Bolo of the state. Naturally, the Akarodhaksha should be well aware of taking wealth out of the mines. He was to engage the private enterprise in case of expensive mines, mining. He was also to claim the same at the same time a certain part of the mineral wealth as payable to the royal treasury. If the private ownership or private individual was allowed to take out of the earth my mineral mining wealth, he was to pay to the state certain share because all land was owned by the state. So nothing could be completely private, nothing could be private or completely individual. So he was to pay certain amount to the state. He was also to dim diminish the state expenditure on the work of mining. So next. Akarod Daksha was to send the mineral wealth to the state-owned industries or factories, that is Kormanto. 
and these factories were controlled by the Lohat Dakshu, Khannakat Dakshu, subordinate to the Akurat Dakshu. The products produced in those factories were supplied and sold according to the instruction or directives of the state. There was another high-ranking official, Shutra Dakshu, the yarn and liquor industries, Shura Dakshu. Industries were controlled by the Shutra Dakshu and Shura Dakshu. The industries related to ship, ship building, mining, weapon making, liquor producing, yarn producing, yarn producing, etc. were controlled by the state. The state controlled the less important industrial functions by imposing taxes thereon. Now, we find another type of activity, economic activity, is trade and commerce. As we have already known that things could be raised, things could be taken to the people only through the channels of trade and commerce. And that also was under the state authority that is controlled by the state. The Greek accounts refer to a group of state officials called Astinomoi. They watched whether trade fixed the trader fixed the old goods, mixed the old goods with the new ones at the time of selling. Even today also we find the trader to have done this. According to Megasthenes sales taxes were collected from the traders. The 30 member committee looked after the markets. In order to facilitate the trading exchanges, roads were also arranged and maintained. They were agronomoi who maintained roads or overland routes. The Langman inscription that is from Afghanistan refers to a Karopothi that is royal road. This there was a long road from Pataliputra via northwest and it went to West Asia. Next we find the affairs of trade and commerce were looked after by the Pannadhaksho. This officer was essential to be an economist. He was to be well aware of the places of the production of trading goods, the ups and downs in their supply, demand and prices, whether they were brought to the market by land or by water, the Pannadhaksho was to frame policy for trade and commerce for the state. Orthoshastra points out that the state would purchase goods, the state would build a storage of those goods in order to check the price rise of the goods. Even today we find the authority government to have stored many products, agricultural or non-agricultural products and distributed those goods in need. The Mohustan and Shagoura inscriptions also support this when goods were distributed as relief from the storage of the state to the people. What we get next? The state stored commodities so as to meet this type of situation in need. The Pannod Daksha was also responsible for the sale of the goods produced from the lands and in the factories owned by the state. The officer could engage individual merchants who in turn were bound to sell a certain amount of the royal goods. They were further charged with taxes. The state control over trade and commerce was also exercised by fixing the prices of commodities and profits for the merchant or trader. To the profit for the indigenous merchant was fixed at 5%, 10% profit was fixed for the foreign merchant according to Kautillo. Remember one thing here, foreign merchant was given 10% profit. That is, maybe there was enough support to the foreign merchant who were allowed to come to this land to trade in different goods so that state could provide their more income to the treasury. And in comparison to this, we find that the indigenous trader was given 5% profit. So everywhere we find the state authority to have made their profits. Next, it is to be noted that the merchant was fined in that connection if, if the merchant was found to be of guilty in connection with their trading activities. His commodities were confiscated by the state if he had increased the prices of commodities for high profit.
according to the Orthoshastra. The market price of a commodity was determined on the basis of its production cost, the cost of its carriage from the production center to the market, also to the also the profit of the trader. Next, we find more important thing that is coins, that is metallic pieces guaranteed by the state authority. Those were used or in order to facilitate the tasks of economic activities or transactions. The development of trade and commerce was facilitated by the use of coins. The punch marked coins and cast coins were used. The metal standard weight and purity of the coins were also regulated that they are so regulated that there was state control in the use of coins in the market. We have coins from Northwest India, Gangetic Valley, Central India, North Bengal and the Deccan. These coins show the peacock sitting on the gate. The state even today also we have symbols on the currency notes and also on coins. Maybe Gandhiji's image or parliament image. Similarly, exactly in a similar way, during the Mauryans also they had the symbol that is peacock sitting on the gate. The state had the right to make coins. The Even today also this is true. The officer who was entrusted with the re responsibility of making coins was designated as Rupodarshaka. All these economic factors paved the way towards the growth of urbanization about which we have already referred to earlier. Next, uh, we, see, we see administrative machinery to collect surplus production, the spread of trade and commerce and artisanal activities contributed to urbanization in the Middle Gangetic Valley during the 6th century BCE. The presence of Megasthenes in the city of Pataliputra indicates that the, the fact that the city had gained an international standard. An administrative council looked after the foreigners who came to the city. Even today also we find many foreigners coming to India and its different cities. Archaeological excavations at Kaushambi, Takshila, Song near Mathura, Mahasthangarh point out the urban features of these places. Koshambi was characterized by the drainage system. Takshila shows the city was featured with residential houses. The re remains of a road have also come to light, about which we have already talked to you. That is Karopati, Royal Road. Mothra was, has shown the development of broad bead industry in the 4th century BCE. The plants of residential buildings have also been exposed at Song. Mahavasya Patanjali supports the development of urbanization at Mathura. The Mahasthangar inscription refers to the city of Pundranagara, Pundranagara, that is Pundravardhan, that is North Bengal, of Pundranagara as well as a well protected one, that is city. The city has yielded beads, punch marked coins, iron implements, and terracottas of the Mauryan period. How these economic activities were administratively controlled. In that connection, we find the revenue administration, that is revenues, taxes were collected from, not only from the agricultural farmers, but also non-farmers, that is industrialists or artisans, from whom the state collected its revenues. So, that those revenues were also administered by the state authority and in that connection we find revenue administration. So what we see the administration was so arranged as to successfully collect revenues as I have told you just now the Shamaharta and the Shannidhata were concerned with the collection of revenues and the maintenance of its accounts. Shamaharta was to collect revenues from the forts, mines, forest, trade, routes, etc. The king was traditionally entitled to get one-sixth part as revenue. This might have been one-sixth or one-fourth during the rule of the Mauryas. The cultivators engaged in the work of production in the Sheeta land were to pay revenues. 
Firstly, they used to pay one fourth or one fifth part of the produce as revenue. It depended on the assistance of the state extended to the farmer. Secondly, another kind of revenue called Udokobhago was collected from the agrarian sector. It was called water sales. The rate of this water sales depended on how water was for irrigation was taken. If the water for irrigation was taken by a machine from a pond or river, then the sales was fixed at the highest rate at one third. The state collected tax called ayo from mines according to the orthodox. The Bachabhumiko Mahamatra, Mahamata, as known from Ashoka's inscriptions, was concerned with the collection of tax from the pasture ground brojo. Taxes shukra, suko, vartani, kinds of taxes were collected from trade routes. Even today also we find national highways to, when we use national highways, we pay taxes. Even carriages also pay their taxes when they are using national highways. Not always, all roads are under tax, but national highways are under tax so that those roads are maintained well. During the emergency, even during the emergency situation, taxes were collected. This tax was called pronoyo. During emergency, the cultivator was compelled to produce more. The state enjoyed the right to collect taxes at the rate more than the normal rate of tax. King could impose the emergency taxation once during the period of his reign. It appears that the Mauryan state had an unprecedented control, as I have already told you, control and monitoring over almost all economic activities. The control of and monitoring by the state of all economic activities was aimed, it appears, to augment the power of the state, I, I have already told you, and not to ensure the happiness of the common people. The Mauryan state was interested in to collect as much resources as possible only for the sake of the interest of the state, a state authority. It was interested to stabilize as much as possible the authority of the state. It is said that the Mauryan state controlled economy, state controlled economy was in favor of the com common people. It is said, but not in practice. So far as the Orthoshastra is concerned, what we get only the state and state stabilized its power and authority at the cost of the people as much as possible at any how it was to be uh, made a success. Okay, students, thank you very much for the fact that you have visited EPG Patshala for this particular piece of information and what we get from this uh, program, particularly on this topic, we get that in the remote past, our ancestors in our land had developed authority and control over economic activities particularly, not only for the stabilization of the authority, but also they took care of the interests of the people at some places as we have seen in the case of traders' activities. They were always taking care of the fact that traders could not get chance of mixing old goods with the new ones so that common people could be cheated. This was definitely in favor of the common people on behalf of the state. So this is how we may be, we may remain aware of our past people activities in this particular sector of the economy. Thank you.